Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here at South End Baptist Church. We're glad you're able to join us either here physically or virtually as well on the World Wide Web. We're grateful for that opportunity for you to be with us this morning. Let me wish all the fathers out there a happy Father's Day. Hope you've got big plans ahead of you for today. Hopefully, folks, you can just enjoy that time with your families and celebrate uh, those men who have meant so much to us in our lives. So I just want to take some time here in just a moment and pray and open our service. So if you join me in a word of prayer, let's go ahead and get started. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst today. We thank you for how you speak to us. We're grateful for all those men who have invested so much in our lives that you've allowed to emulate your example as our great Heavenly Father. And we're thankful for your work in our lives, your love for us, and the way you nurture us. Father, bless this time in worship. May you be exalted and lifted up in every way by all that we do and say today. Thank you for calling us your children. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, you can stay seated, but we will worship.
do a special for you all but I'm gonna come over here to this piano because I feel like it's one getting neglected it's not being used so we'll be okay <laughs> um, so with this song it is an old well I'm gonna say it's an old hymn but it's probably not gonna be an old hymn but it's be still my soul and with everything going on in the world and just life this song and um, um, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, have really, like, been tugging at me a lot. So, I found this song, I kind of just looked it up on um, iTunes, and this one came up, and I really liked it, and they kind of put a little twist in there, too, they added a chorus. Um, but, mainly, it's the, it's the hymn, and if you just listen to the words, they're so, that's what I like about hymns they kind of take scripture out of everywhere and they just also just really dig deep into they just really dig deep and you're just like wow that hymn really what's going on in life today so this song is one of the songs that did that so just listen just take it all in put it in your heart i mean and if um i don't i don't have the words up there but it is in your hymnal oh you don't have the hymnals never mind but <laughs> if you want to look it up on your phones then you can use that God. 
Despite the future as he has the past, thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be brought at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know his voice who Thank you, Chelsea. That was very applicable for the days in which we live. Would you agree with that, friends? That's very applicable. You know, it's easy to get in a hurry in life, isn't it? To get concerned about this, and we've got to do this, this, and this, and all these things, we've got to get it done and not rest in the knowledge of who our God is and know that He is in control, and we trust Him and we walk with Him. It's good to see a few more of you out today here at church. We're kind of beginning to build again. It's kind of nice to see folks coming out again. Uh, Several are feeling more comfortable, and that's fine. We want you to come at your own pace as you do. We'll continue to, as you know, offer the live stream from what I'm told by our wise tech team from here on. So uh, that's their plan. Uh, So they'll continue to do that. So uh, that that is always an opportunity for folks. And we have folks uh, that tune in from all across the country. You guys have got a lot of friends and former members that are tuning in. Did you know that? Uh, I keep hearing they kind of pop up on the screen. You can watch that later sometime. You'll see the different folks that pop in, which is kind of neat that folks can join us and worship in that way, which is a good experience. So if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to be in Psalm 147, where we'll be here in a little bit. But I'm kind of, we're going to be looking at the, one of the names of God that's very familiar. It's called Jehovah Rapha. And Jehovah Rapha means God who heals, our healer. And it actually comes, it's first mentioned in the Scriptures, in Exodus chapter 15, in that encounter where the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt, and they're wanting some water, and they're not able to get water, and then water comes, and that is the idea of the healing that comes from the water that they're able to receive, and that's where the name is used uh, in the book of Exodus, where it uses the name Jehovah Rapha to describe 
God who heals. That when we're in the midst of struggle or in the midst of difficulty, we're in a place where we don't know what to do, God is the one who is able to move in our hearts and lives. So if you have your copy of God's Word, there are some here if you would like to stand, feel free to stand with me if you would in honor reading God's Word at home. Obviously, you don't have to stand. You don't, I'm going to read it. It's up to you. That's completely on you. We're going to read Psalm 147, and it is a lengthy psalm, so I want to read this text to you. And the psalmist writes, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and praise is becoming. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. He counts the numbers of the stars. He gives names to all of them. Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. The Lord supports the afflicted. He brings down the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises to our God on the lyre who covers the heavens with clouds, who provides rain for the earth, who makes the grass grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens which cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He does take no pleasure in the legs of man. The Lord favors those who fear him, those who wait for his loving kindness. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your sons within you. He makes peace in your borders. He satisfies you with the finest of the wheat. He sends forth his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts forth his ice as as fragments. Who can stand before his cold? He sends forth his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters to flow. He declares his words to Jacob, his statutes and his ordinance to Israel. He has not dealt with thus with any nation, and as for his ordinances, they have not they have not known them. Praise the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the psalmist and the words that he gives us today, and we're grateful that they were recorded so long ago. And I pray, Father, as I use and look through this text and we kind of walk through this, Father, I pray that you would guide us and the Holy Spirit lead us. And remind us that you are Jehovah Rapha. You are our healer. You are our strength. You are our encourager. And we are grateful for your presence in our midst today. Bless this time and use it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. A lot of the things in life we face, and all of us have scars. We have things that impact us in life. Injuries that come. Some of those are those injuries we had as small children. We were riding our bike a little too fast. I'm sure none of you did that, right? Or maybe you tried to pop a wheelie or you tried to jump something, you know, I, and really never thought that going off about a six-inch ramp could be scary. But when I was a little kid, it was pretty scary going off the end of that six-inch ramp and flying through the air. You thought you were flying 100 feet in the air, but you're probably only going a foot and a half off the ground maybe. And you're going along there and you're wondering you're going to land and then you didn't realize and think through all the process of the landing. And I was with a lot of friends and we would do that on our bikes and we would, we would notice a lot of times when we would ride the bikes like that and we would do that, you know, we were really good at going up in the air, but the landing was the problem. Now, I am old enough to remember a gentleman that was a daredevil back in the 60s and 70s that was very famous, name of Evil Knievel. Does anyone, a handful of us remember him? And he did some really crazy stuff. And I remember that was kind of the, the genre, the era which we lived in. A lot of us guys tried to imitate that on our bikes, you know, our little bicycles. And of course, I also realized as I was doing that, that something was happening to the forks on my front on the front tire. Did you, would you, can you imagine what was happening as I was landing? That they were starting to spread, and I even had a tire come off once. That was fun. But anyway, didn't learn. I thought I could be like Evil Knievel or Robert Knievel. I could have that kind of experience, and you know, obviously nowhere near the, the speed or the height or any of that, but you know, when you're eight, nine, ten years old, you, you know, think you've got it figured out. But oftentimes when I would do that, there would usually be an incident where I would fall and scrape myself, and a time or two pretty nasty cuts would be a result of my, I'll just say it, stupidity. That would be the, the, and so that would cause issues in my life, and I would go home like most kids, cry to mom, say, hey, look what I did, what what do I, and she would put the, that, that orange stuff that comes out of the little tubes, remember that? the disinfectant on there and clean out the wound, you know, and of course that hurt when you did that, but after a while it would heal and of course, what would I do? I would go do it again because that's what boys do. We would do silly things like that. And I think a lot of times in our walk, we do the same thing. We have an injury, we have something that takes place and the injury may not be physical. Oftentimes the ones that cause us more grief are the emotional and spiritual injuries that linger in our soul, aren't they? Someone hurts us, someone causes something to happen or maybe because of our own lack of 
observation of the way we handle the situation, it causes grief in a family or in a group of friends, and there's hurt feelings and all of those things that take place and those emotions that we struggle with. We want someone to heal them, and God is our Jehovah Rapha. He is our healer even in those situations and other things that we face. And I think as a nation right now, we are going through a period like that where many people are festering old wounds and bringing up wounds and creating new ones out of the old ones and causing issues and grief and causing pain for themselves and emotional pain for others. And I'm not trying to demean what has happened years ago and and the pain of others, but I do think there is a lot of things that are happening in the hearts and lives of people that really aren't necessary in our world today. Bringing things to fruition that are causing grief and pain that really is not productive, right? Right? That's what I'm sensing for me, and that's, that's the struggle. And I think part of that is, is because of the perspective that all of this comes from. This is a very human-centered, man-centered, atheistic point of view. I'm just going to say it. It does not put God in the equation of what is taking. The healing comes, and only true healing comes in a relationship with Jesus Christ as he is able to mend the broken heart, to fix the emotions, to help us deal with things that we deal with as only he can. And many of you in this room today and none of you that are watching have experienced things in your life that are very difficult to overcome. Pain, betrayal, suffering, abuse, a variety of things. We could go and name the list that many people that are, I know I've talked with some of our church that have dealt with some horrible things in their life. And the only way you get the healing that you need and get beyond that is by the power and grace and work of God, correct? It does not simply come with better techniques of self-help, and those can help mask the pain, those can help deal with it, but God is the only one that can des- deliver true healing in our lives, and that's what I want us to focus on in this psalm, and we're, not, we're gonna kind of skim through these verses, and I, I gave you the entire psalm to look at to see it, but we're really focusing on just a handful of verses in this text that really bring out the characteristic of Jehovah Rapha, God our healer, and what he desires to do in our lives, and how he desires to heal us and deliver us from some of the things that we let hang on. Now, I've shared with you before about my grandmother, my dad's mom, Mildred. Interesting lady, loved her to death. But she was a proud woman, and she believed, and this was, and she told me this, if she told me this once, she told me a hundred times, we are Coopers, and we do two things well. You ready? We have pride in our heritage, and we hold grudges. Yeah, that's Grandma. And you had to know my grandma, you know, this, you're, you're getting this second hand. But she said that many times about holding grudges that we remember, you know. And dad would say that Cooper's got memory, you know, memory like an elephant. You know how that is. We remember things then. And I thought, you know, that was interesting. But as I grew up and began to understand, that probably isn't very healthy emotionally, is it? To hang on to stuff and to hold stuff that happened years ago. And in her case, she could remember what happened to her when she was a kid. And at the time, you know, of course, at that time, your grandparents always seem ancient to you, no matter what age you are, right? But... It must have been a long time ago, and she remembered these things, and she held people account for what they did years ago. And they were bad things. I'm not saying they were good things, but she held them account. I thought, is that really helping, Grandma? As I got older, I began to wonder about that. And I, even some of those same characteristics festered into my own life and the way that I looked at people and dealt with people because I had a bad experience with someone, and therefore anyone that was like them, I had the same attitude toward. Do you understand where I'm going with this? And that is not Christ-like. Can we say that? I think we can agree on that. That is not anything that demonstrates the work of God in my life. That is not. That's, and that today in our world, we deal with some legalistic things where we want to say, okay, you know, this happened, so this, happened. this is the way you must respond. No. The Scriptures teach us that, and Paul says it so well in 2 Corinthians 5, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has what? passed away. All things have become new. There is a change in our relationship with God. Can you imagine what it would be like if God held everything against us that we did wrong? Yeah. I'm in trouble if that happens. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, to say I'm toast would be an understatement. There is no hope for me because I've got a list Miles and miles long of things I've done, and many of you have lists, maybe not as long as mine, but you've got long lists too. You know what I'm talking about. But fortunately, God desires to show us mercy, doesn't he? Now, he doesn't just ignore it and say, well, that was just boys being boys or girls being girls or whatever. He doesn't do that. What does he do? He knows there's a penalty for that. It is sin. That sin separates us from God, and so 
He sends his son to pay that penalty for us. And Jesus takes on all the sin of all the world. That's what happened on that mount on Calvary, doesn't he? He takes it all upon himself. And in those moments, he literally becomes my sin, your sin, the sin of everyone that has ever lived. He becomes sin. And on the cross, he delivers us. He heals us from this, not just the stain and the punishment, but the the scar that sin, the emotional scars that sin brings, he delivers us from that. And what we have to learn to do as followers of Jesus Christ is to learn to live in that healing, to understand that forgiveness. And then as we understand that forgiveness, it should empower us and enable us through the work of the Holy Spirit in us to practice forgiveness towards others, right? Now, it's easy to receive forgiveness sometimes, but it's a little harder to give forgiveness, isn't it? Because sometimes people do some pretty horrible stuff. I mean, people are cruel. They can be horrific. You know, I, I, I seem to think that, you know, as I look back in history that, you know, people can't get any worse than Genghis Khan. I mean, he was pretty bad. If you want to know, I'm not going to get into the details. If you know if anything about Genghis Khan, he was a horrible human being and extremely cruel. But I think we've had people that have amped it up a little bit in the 19th, 18th, and since he lived, that are even worse than he has been. How do you get beyond that? How do you deal with that when you experience that? How does a, you know, and I, I remember watching years ago an incident that happened in the central part of the country, in the Amish community, you might remember a, a shooting. And uh, several children who were parts of this Amish school, they were killed. And I'll never forget for as long as I live an interview with the mother of one of these children who had just been murdered. And they asked her how she was going to respond. Of course, they didn't have to worry about the shooter. They, they killed him. He was dead. But how she was going to respond to the family of this shooter that lived in her community still, that was still around them and still lived, how she was going to treat her because of what her husband had done. And she said, Jesus forgave me, so I forgive her. That's all she said. Oh, my gosh, you'd have thought she'd have spoke some awful words of whatever. I mean, she got, I mean, people were just, they couldn't believe it. That's crazy. How can you forgive the family? How can you treat, no, that doesn't, you, revenge. You want to treat her with contempt and shit. You know what? But she under, this, this woman understood the gospel, didn't she? Because when I begin to think of what others do to me and the harm that they've caused me, and it's bad from my perspective, but when I think of what I have done and rebelled against God and what God has forgiven me for, oh my. I have no room to condemn. No room to cast stones because of what I have done. And brothers and sisters, the same can be said of every person that had walked the face of planet Earth. Because every one of us, as I read the scriptures pretty clear in Romans, all have sinned. You remember that verse? I know all the Iwana kids, but they know that verse real well. It's one of the ones you memorize. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What part of all have sinned have we, do we not understand? That applies to every one of us. No matter how good we think we are, and we say, well, my sin, and I love how we, cat well, my sin's not as bad. No, your sin may not be as bad, and the consequences may not be as bad as someone else, but sin is sin. How many sins does it take to separate us from God forever? One sin. What happened in the Garden of Eden? They did something. It didn't seem so bad. I mean, they ate the wrong fruit, right? You know, they did the exact thing God told them not to do, didn't they? They rebelled against God, and we do the same thing. We like to cast, you know, we like to make light. Well, it was their fault. Well, no, not really. I think if any one of us had been in the garden, we'd have done the same thing or something just as stupid. Pretty competent of that. People, we just, that's the way we are. And we rebel. Because one of the things we don't like people telling us, we don't like people telling us what to do and that we're not in control. And that's really, when you look at that sin, that's a lot of what that sin's about. Because what does he say? If you eat of this tree, what's Satan say? Well, God doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to know everything. He wants to keep you in the dark. Right? He doesn't want you to understand. He doesn't want you to know the difference. He just wants you to, he, he doesn't know what's best for you. This will be best. You'll know everything. It'll, you'll be, your mind will be 
This is what you want. That's what Satan says. And he does that same line today about everything else, doesn't he? Oh, you need to do that. I mean, it'll free you if you'll just do that. I mean, you're just being bound by the whatever, the, the, the rigid structure of culture of, of a patriarchal society or whatever you want to throw out there. People say, if you just let go and just do whatever you want, you'll feel better about yourself. Oh, really? It doesn't work that way, does it? And many of you have been around folks, maybe you struggle with that yourself, who have tried to live in accordance with that lifestyle and seen the price for it. But gratefully, God is our healer. That even when we make mistakes, even when we don't do what we're supposed to do, even when we rebel against him, even when we shake our fist in his face, he heals us. Now I want you to look at verse 3 in that text again. We're going to camp there for a little bit because that's really, I think, the heart of what he's talking about here in Psalm 147. It says he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. You ever been brokenhearted? You ever been disappointed? You ever been betrayed by someone? You ever had something happen that shouldn't have happened, treated unjustly in a way that didn't make sense? Someone you trusted betrayed you or did the wrong thing or didn't live up to what you expected and you feel betrayed and you are broken. Your heart is hurting because of what has happened. And yet the psalmist says he heals the broken hearts and he binds up their wounds. Now, that's interesting to me that, and as I was thinking and looking and studying on this, this, this one verse, like I said, there's 20 verses here. We could have camped up, but this one really struck me because of, of the way the psalmist is defining this and using this. He compares the brokenhearted. A lot of times we think the wounds that you don't see aren't really wounds. We think the only wounds that really count are the ones on the flesh, Right? But the real truth is the wounds that can destroy you, the wounds that can hurt you, the wounds that can cripple you often are the wounds of the spirit and the emotions. And many of you have seen it in your own lives. You've seen it in your families. You've seen it among friends. You've seen it among people that it's an emotional and it's something that happened and it really wasn't anything physical. Nobody beat them with a stick. Nobody, but there's that emotional scar that just hangs on and, and like, a, like a festering wound they've never dealt with and it continues to impact the way that they treat themselves and treat other people. And what the scriptures remind us here is that we have a healer that can deliver us from that. Yes, he can heal the physical ailments, but more importantly, he can heal the emotional wounds, the scars that keep us from being what God and who God wants us to be. Because at the heart of all this, the heart of the scriptures generally is God is trying to make us, help us become like Jesus. Did you know that? That is your goal as a Christian. It's not to become like your pastor. Praise God, no. It's not to become like one of those people on TV that you like to listen to that's really a good preacher, but you don't know what their life's like, and I'm not, they might be fine. I don't know. It's not to become like anybody else but like Jesus. Jesus is the example. He is the standard for all of us. If we want to say, well, I'm doing pretty good with this, how does my lifestyle, how does the way that I treat other people, how does the compassion that I show, how does that measure up to Jesus? I don't know how you are. I can speak from personal experience. I don't measure, I'm not, it's not even close. It's just sad for me. And Jesus says, I know. Well, says, okay. Let's continue to move on this road. Let's continue to walk this path. Because that, that is the ultimate goal of the believer, is to live a life that demonstrates Christ's transformation in you and demonstrates the characteristics and the power and the love and the peace and the holiness of Jesus, all of those things are encompassed in that. And only the healer, only God can enable us to do that. And, and then the psalmist, and what I'd really encourage you to just read this psalm again, this, the, the things he lists about who God is and what God is able, he goes through this list of all the things that God does. And like in verse four, he counts the numbers of the stars and names them. And he goes on down and he, he talks about the Lord supports the afflicted. He brings the wicked to the ground in verse, in verse six. The Lord favors those who fear him. Those who wait for his loving kindness in verse 11. He gives to the beast its food in verse 9. And the young ravens which cry. He provides for nature. He does all these things. This is the God that we worship. He has all this ability, all this power. Verse 14. He makes peace in your borders. He satisfies you with the finest wheat. All of these things are pointing to the power of God. God has this kind of power to do whatever he desires and he can deliver you and heal you from those scars, 
that are staying in your spirit and are hampering the way you see life, the way you see yourself, and the way you see others. He can deliver us from that. Now, is it going to happen right now? Probably not. It took a while to get those scars, didn't it? To get that misperception, to get that misunderstanding of the way life was and the way people are. It takes a while to heal that. But God, and by his Holy Spirit, is the only way that we can have the de- deliverance and healing that we so desperately need. And I don't think it's just for us as individuals. I think it's for us as a nation. We need deliverance. We need the deliverance of God. We need the Holy Spirit to do a work like he's never done. We need revival in America. We need an awakening to remind us of who we are and who God is so that he can truly bring about the healing in this land that only he can bring. Not a superficial healing, not a surface level whatever that kind of looks good for a moment but really doesn't change your life. Because of the sin and the, the stuff that's in my spirit and in the spirit of many who follow, many of us, we want to be delivered from that, don't we? We want to experience healing. We want to experience strength. We want to live like Christ lived. But to do that, it only comes, here it comes, you knew it was coming, through surrender, doesn't it? Surrendering to the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Surrendering to Christ alone. To his, what he has done for us. Understanding that God knows what is best for me and for you. And God desires to do a work that only he can do. You know, we can do things, self-help. We can do some things. Some, there's some you know, tools you can do to make yourself better for a while, but after a while that breaks down because, you know, we're people. And after a while, we, no one else forgets out there, do they? Ever, anybody ever read anything and forgot it a couple of days later or maybe an hour later or maybe two minutes later? Yeah, you know, we all do. And that's what happens a lot of times. We get these great thoughts and these great ideas and we're ready to go and then, ah, uh, it's hard. It's just what we do. All of us struggle with that. But the Holy Spirit empowers us to live in a way that we cannot live in in our own strength. I cannot emphasize this enough. That the difference between us before Christ and after coming to know Christ is the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? No, but it means you have one walking along with you that can help you see those things that come. Oh, that's a trap. You don't want to do that. Or, you know, it would really be better if you did it this way. Anybody ever heard that voice before? Before you do something or say something, I have. I don't always listen to it, and neither do you, and that's okay, but that's what God is trying to do. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And not only does he tell us the right thing and give us direction intellectually, he empowers us from within in the Spirit. As we surrender to him and unleash that power in us, he empowers us to live in a way that we are not capable of living in the flesh, but by the Spirit, we can live in that way. We can do things with the pure motives. We can honor God in a way that we cannot do in the flesh, but we can in the Spirit. And you say, well, how do you know that? You ever seen the example of the Savior? Why did Jesus pray so much? You ever wonder about that? Why was Jesus always going up to the mountain or wherever into the wilderness or by himself to pray? Why do you think he was doing that? I mean, we're talking Jesus here. I mean, he's the Son of God. I mean, that should be pretty significant, right? He should have some really strong will and ability to just overcome anything. When he was tempted for 40 days by Satan in the wilderness, you remember? What had he been doing before that? Or 10, 40, he was tempted for a day, but what had he been doing for 40 days, you remember? Fasting and praying. That's right. He was talking to the Father. He was spending time with God. He was preparing himself for whatever may come. Now, if Jesus needs to prepare himself for temptation, if he needs, to, needs God's guidance and counsel to prepare himself for the situations where the enemy's going to come, how much more do me and you need that? A lot. Is that a fair statement? What do you think? Do you think our ability to have strong self-will and overcome the schemes of the enemy is less than Jesus? <laughs> yeah. We need the Holy Spirit's guidance in that. We need his encouragement. We need his strength to empower us when we face things. But often, more often than not, rather than do that, we try to do that in our own flesh. We try to face Satan one-on-one, and we think, I can deal with Satan. I can overcome him. And we forget. We don't have that in us. We don't have that power. We don't have that ability. We don't have that strength. I want to look at another verse real quick. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it to you. Isaiah 43, 1. And I think really, and I'd encourage you to read this, another great passage of Scripture. 
But this is a reminder. You know, a lot of people think when they think how God views me, they think God is just waiting to zap me or God doesn't like me or God kind of tolerates me. This is what God says through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 43. But now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who has formed you, O Israel, do not fear. Hmm. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Let me read that again. But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, he who has formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by, my, by name. You are mine. Those last three words should echo in your spirit from now till Jesus comes back, or you are called home, whichever comes first. I don't know. You are mine, says God. If you're a child of God, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are his. You are a part of his family. He has adopted you. He has made you his. And the God who heals, Jehovah Rapha, who desires to change and transform you, he can do things in your life that no one else can do. But he wants you to entrust yourself to him and let him lead you. And that's hard, I know, but it's the only way we will grow in the walk that he has called us to walk in. It is a struggle some days in this world to flesh out the truth of God's mercy that he's performed in us. There are days that I don't want to be very forgiving towards other people. How about you? And there are things that are done to all of us. There are things that are said that frustrate us and cause us grief and cause us pain. But is the God that we worship bigger than the pain that we feel? Is the God that we worship bigger than the systems and the structures of our world that seem to cause us grief at times? Is the Lord God of heaven, Jehovah Rapha, is he more powerful, is he bigger than the U.S. government and all of our military put together? In a second, I'll take him. There is no one, nothing in all of creation that compares to him, let alone can compete. Nothing even begins to compare to him. And this God who loves us, this God who has adopted us, this God who has brought us into his family, that has declared himself our healer, says, trust me, child. I will heal your broken heart. I will bind up your wounds. I will walk with you. Trust me. What would our world be like? Better yet, what would our churches be like if we began to grasp that for a second? If we really begin to grasp what it meant that God is truly our healer, that he is the only one that can heal us from those things that keep us awake at night. Those things that we just can't seem to let go of. Those things that just, for whatever reason, we struggle with. And we all have them. Those emotions that keep coming back because of whatever happened in the past. And I'm not trying to say that whatever happened in the past wasn't significant. That is not what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is that God is bigger than that. Does that make sense? No matter what you encounter, no matter what you face. And I have seen God do that work in my life, and I've seen him do it in the lives of others, deliver them through things that really logically didn't make sense that they could get through that. But because of God's power, because of God's work, and because of the Holy Spirit's presence in life, and their willingness to surrender to God's will, it's gonna be your way, God, and nobody else's. God was able to do what only God can do. And what would it be like in the church of Jesus Christ in the United States if we truly began to let God be God? If we quit putting restrictions on him and caveats and thinking, God, I'll follow you if, blah, 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 you know, I want this, I want that, and God just, we just said, okay, God, whatever you want to do, do it. I don't care what it costs me, I don't care what happens to me, God. I want you to be glorified. And until we get to that point, I don't think he's going to move, brothers and sisters, like he wants to move. We're going to tell God how to do what he does. I'm almost done. We're close to the end. I know. I've went a little over than usual today. Sorry for those watching. I'm going a little long today. 
Many years ago, I got my driver's license. Anybody remember that day when I got the driver's license? I was really excited. Anyone else? Now, I flunked it the first time, took it the second time, had the exact same tester the second time. The same guy. There had to be a dozen at our local courthouse. How did I get the same guy again? And I had that look on my face when he got in my car, and he had the same look, oh, God, not this guy again. I mean, I, I flunked it by one point. I was so mad when I missed it by one point. But I composed myself, and I got it done. And I passed it <laughs> by one point. So anyway, I got it done. But as I think of that experience, and I think of all that you know, angst that was going on in my spirit, I think a lot of times we look at our relationship with God the same way. I wonder when I sin and I commit the same sin that I did, that I've already asked forgiveness for and repented from for, and I come to God, and I'm like, God, it's me again. Yeah, I did it again. What kind of look, the kind of look I think God has on his face is probably not the kind of look God has on his face. Because God is willing to show us abundant mercy. A mercy that we can't even begin to fathom. A mercy that we don't deserve. Because his point for every one of us as his children is that we come to know him and experience him in a way, in a deeper way, in a way that is more incredible than we could even begin to fathom in this life. When we use the phrase, God loves you, I don't think we get it. Because, I mean, that, that sounds nice. God loves you. Because we love pizza, some people. Some people love steak. Some people love insert whatever. And we have lost sight of what that word truly means. But when God says, I love you, There is a depth. There is an eternal value to that love. Do you know when God stops loving you? Never. Never. Because he loves with that as only he can. With a depth and a scope that we can only experience, we cannot explain. And I'm kind of glad we can't explain it. I'm kind of glad I can't figure it out and put it down in four easy points for you to figure out. You just have to experience it. To know that no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how far you have drifted from him, you're only one step away from him if you turn around. That's what repentance means. It literally means to turn around. So he can heal you. And I'm not talking about disease. He may do that too. But he can heal you of all the scars and the bitterness and all the junk that has infested our spirits. And it happens to all of us. And it can destroy us. And only he can do it. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your faithfulness, for your mercy, for your strength, and how you touch us. And I pray, Lord God, that today as we continue in this time of worship, if there is one who is listening to this or maybe one who is here today and wants to respond to you, I pray that today would be the day they would respond to the call of the Holy Spirit on their life and to know that you have set them apart and you love them. Thank you, Lord, for loving us in spite of us and because of who you are. Bless this time and use it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chelsea? All right. And with all that said, we're going to sing, Jesus Paid It All. Watch and pray. 
Well, thank you so much for coming and joining us today, those of you and those of you that joined us on uh, Facebook Live. We're grateful for you joining us as well. Had a, we're going to close with a word of prayer. I had a couple prayer requests that were given to me earlier uh, from Karen Wilkins. I'm going to make sure I got these right, Karen. I want to pray for Renee. Uh, she's on a mission trip. And then Megan Davidson, she's in hospice, and that 13, is that her age? 13-year-old girl in hospice. So we want to pray for Megan and her family. Uh, so we're gonna just, I'm going to just pray, and you can join along with me, and then we'll, we'll close in that. Father, we, just, we are so grateful for your mercy and your work, and we lift up Renee as she serves on this mission trip. We pray for safety, pray for favor, and you bless her. We especially pray for Megan and her family. Oh, Lord, I can't imagine the emotions they're going through and all that's going on, but I pray for the work of your Holy Spirit. We pray, as always, for, for healing. But, we, Father, we also know that you will do a work and can do a work beyond our understanding of the situation. And the same is true for each and every one of us in our lives, wherever we find ourselves, Lord, that we trust you in the process of what we are going through, knowing that you will do what only you can do through us. Father, help us to surrender to whatever it is you desire to do in our lives today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, folks. God bless.